Okay, so uh, picking up, let's yeah. pick this back up. Yes, thank you, very good. Okay, so mixers, they, how about I sit? Okay, so the mixer uh, takes multiple sounds, mixes them together, and sends it to a place that you can hear it. So I was doing them one at a time a second ago, but I can do them all at the same time. Right? So the mixer is taking all those things, putting them all together into one thing, and playing it, well, really two things, because I've got two speakers. Um, but it puts them all here. So everything is coming out at this spot, okay? That's why we call it a mixer, because it literally mixes everything together and sends it somewhere, okay? It always sends it through to the master? No. No. Um, not, not necessarily. Does it just matter on the output that you put it on? Um, we're going to get to that. But, um, but, the, but the principle here is, is, I just want you to understand why we call it a mixer. Because just like, you know, think about it like a kitchen mixer where you're making cookies, right? You got all the ingredients, you're going to put them all in one little bowl and it's going to mix it all together. Like that's what this does, it just does it with sounds, okay? It just mixes them all up together, okay? Uh, now, you have a lot of options for how it mixes it all together. And that's really what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. But the first thing you got to understand is how the stuff gets in. So... It comes in on a cable, usually, like this. Okay, so this is just a little XLR cable, or mic cable, and there on the back of this, there are the connections for each of these. So, um, you know, each of these rows of controls represent a separate input on the mixer. Okay, uh, so if I want something to go through this set of controls, I that this has got a label of one on it. This is input one, so I plug it into the connector for input one. Now, uh, the first thing that the sound encounters, as it, like the signal literally moves down this little strip through every one of these little circuits. Every one of these little knobs or buttons represents a little electrical circuit that does something to it or can do something you want it to. Um, so it just kind of runs its way down through there, okay? So I'm going to take you through uh, each of these one at a time. This first one, this first red button, it says 48 volts, okay? Sometimes this will be called phantom power, okay? Now what this is is um, some device, some source devices like this one, which I don't have plugged in right now, but I can actually. I can plug that in, can't I? There we go. There it is. I'll plug it into 10. Um, okay, so it's plugged into 10 right now, and if you notice, um, I don't really have any signal lighting up there. Uh, why? Because this is a microphone that requires electricity to operate. So that microphone is called a dynamic microphone, and it does not require electricity. In fact, it makes its own electricity out of the sound wave in there. Um, so there's a little magnet in there. And uh, the magnet is a little hunk of metal that is attached to this thing we call a diaphragm. And that's usually like, a, like sometimes literally a piece of paper or something that will respond to air pushing pulling on it. And as the air pushes or pulls on it, it moves inside that magnet. And when it moves inside the magnet, it creates a positive or a negative charge on that magnet. And that creates an electrical signal that comes out and you can plug into a mixer, okay? It does that all the time, whether it's connected to anything or not. It's just always responding to the sound in the air and trying to make electricity out of it. Uh, completely passive, always works, no big whoop. This one is a condenser microphone or a capacitance microphone that is, uh, it is essentially a big capacitor. And a capacitor is an electrical component that stores energy, okay? Um, and 
it, the capacitor requires electricity in order to operate. So you have to either put a battery in it. Some of these microphones will ha let you literally put a battery in them. This one doesn't, but some do. Or you have to provide it with some electrical signal in order for it to operate. Uh, and so this first button here called the phantom power or the 48 volts, what it does is if you turn that on, it sends a, a direct current voltage signal down the, the microphone cable to power the device. And then, the, then the, the device sends back audio on that same cable, okay? So if I turn this button on, suddenly I get signal. Uh, there, now I get signal. See how, the, how it's lighting up now and it wasn't before? Uh, and if I turn off the phantom power, it's, it goes away, no sound now, okay? So that's what the phantom power does. It just provides electricity to power microphones or sometimes there are other devices that can use phantom power. That's all it does. There's nothing magical about it. It does, it's not like a, there's some, it's not magic fairy dust or anything that, you know, it's not a ghost that makes your sound better or anything. It's just, it's just electricity, just a power source. Yeah. What happens if you send phantom power to like the other microphone? Ah, excellent question. <laughs> uh, nothing. Oh, okay. In most cases, nothing. Um, so that dynamic microphone is not going to do anything to that. Um, there is a certain kind of microphone that uh, some microphones could be damaged by that. Um, but they're, you're probably not going to encounter any of those. I mean, those are really special microphones that um, are not used often. Um, we certainly don't have any. Um, what so, makes them special? Um, it's just the way they're made, like they're the, the, the way the circuit's designed and everything. They're just not really designed to use phantom power, like you could mess it up. Um, but for the most part, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, the only reason, I mean, you could have it on or off. Um, if it's on and, and you're not, there's nothing connected to it that's using it, um, you're just, you know, it's just using energy that you don't need to use, so just turn it off. Um, but if you turn it on, then the thing works. <laughs> Uh, turn it off and it doesn't work. That's it's, that's really the, the, the important part. Uh, okay, any questions? Any other questions about phantom power? Um, some mixing consoles will uh, give you a global phantom power, meaning like it's just one button somewhere over here that you push and it engages phantom power for all the inputs. Um, yeah? Does phantom power come with the console or mm -hmm. is there a separate... It can be a separate device. Like it, you can you can have like a, a, fan, a phantom power injector that you would put in line between the mixer and the microphone, and that phantom power injector would have to be plugged into you know like an outlet that has electricity on it, and it would inject that that power into the lines. Those exist. We might I think we even have one. Is it like a snake box? Yeah, just it would just be like a, it's a little box like that. You know. um, so. Uh, so yeah, some consoles, it's just a global button. It turns it on for everything. Some consoles, they'll do it in like chunks. So it'll be like, you'll turn it on in banks of four or something. Like you'll turn it on for four inputs or another four inputs or something like that. This console just happens to give them to you for every input, which is really what you want. Um, but you know, in the, in the world of analog consoles, every extra button you add costs money. Um, in the digital world, it doesn't necessarily cost you money. Um, it just cost you code. Yeah. If you have the phantom power on, and on the, turns on on the input that doesn't have anything plugged in, is it just not going to do anything? Yeah. Or is it going to cause issues? No. Okay. No problem. Again, it's just use. It's just it's just a circuit that's operating that doesn't need to operate. Um, so it's not going to hurt anything, but you should probably turn it off if you're not using it. The, uh, because there is the potential, at least, for the phantom power to harm something, there are some things that could be harmed by that. Um, that's why it's just not like always on by default. You know, I mean, you, you need to choose to turn it on. Um, but in most cases, you're it's, you're hardly ever going to run into something that's going to be actually damaged by it. Um, so anyway, all right. Any other questions about phantom power? 
All right, the next thing that this encounters is this little button here. And if you can, I don't know, it's kind of, it's, it's a little small, but it is labeled with like a little O with a slash through it. O slash, okay? And that symbol is generally understood to mean phase. But that is not what the button does. This is really important. When you say phase, do you mean like phase and then like she's going through a phase? Or do you mean like F-A-Z-E? No, yeah, P-H-A-S. Okay. Um, phase is um, phase is a term we use to describe a certain property of a wave. Um, so waves oscillate in cycles, right? They start somewhere, and they move, and then they move again, and then they come back to where they started. Okay, um, and depending on where you are in that process, so like you know. If we graph a sine wave, it starts at zero and goes up, and that, that's representing like a voltage wave or something, that means the voltage is going up, and then it goes down, and then drops below the zero, and then goes back up, and start goes, gets back to where it started, okay? So depending on where you are in that process, that's the phase, the phase you are in. Are you in the zero degree phase, the 90 degree phase, the 100? degree phase, the 270 degree phase, or have you gone a full 360 and gone back to where you started? Okay, that's what we're talking about when, when we talk about phase. And the symbol that is next to this button is the symbol for phase. But the button doesn't do anything to the phase. Um, this is a polarity button. This is one of, one of the most commonly confused concepts in all of sound. Um, so we're going to take a minute and try to see if we can understand it. Polarity refers to, because um, so much of what we do, uh, most of the technology that we use to capture or reproduce sound involves magnets. And magnets have positive or negative poles, right? Uh, and so we tend to describe that that wave process of, of that, that increase, that boost, that peak, um, as a positive pulse, and then that drop as a negative pulse, because that's what happens with the magnet in the loudspeaker, is you're doing a positive pulse and that pushes it out. You do a negative pulse and it pulls it back, and it just does that fast enough and it starts moving the air and making sound, okay? So you have positive and negative pulses. We refer that to that as the polarity. So um, if the polarity was reversed some way, then when you gave it a positive pulse, the loudspeaker would pull back. And you gave it a negative pulse, and the loudspeaker would push forward, which is backwards from what you would normally think. Um, and in an XLR cable, those of you that have taken audio electronics, what are the three pins mean? In our cable? Yeah, so one of the pins is called the positive pin, the other is the negative, and the other is ground. And those two, so those, the pins two and three, which are the positive and negative pins, they alternate against each other, right? So they're, they're, they're oscillating back and forth, right? Um, but they're doing it opposite of each other. So when that positive pin does a positive pulse, the negative pin's going negative. And when the negative pin goes positive, the positive pin goes negative. Like they're opposite of each other, okay? That's how they work. Um, and so what this button does is it just flips that around. So when you would normally have a positive pulse, you now have a negative pulse, and vice versa. It just inverts the signal. Um, and that has nothing to do with phase. <laughs> it, it, it flips the polarity? Yeah. Okay. This is a polarity inversion button. Um, 
Now, the reason that this is commonly misunderstood is that a polarity inversion, when you do it on a sine wave, like a single frequency tone, when you invert the polarity on a sine wave and graph it, it looks the same as if you graph that same sine wave with a 180 degree phase offset. It looks the same, but it is not the same. So it looks the same on a graph, but what is happening in reality is different. Because to do that shift of phase, that involves manipulating time. You have to move that wave in time somehow so that it starts in a different spot or you pick it up in a different spot. But either way, it involves waiting or manipulating time. And that's really, really hard to do in analog circuits, turns out. Um, it's really easy to do with digital circuits. Manipulating time in the digital domain is easy. But manipulating time in the analog domain with sound is really hard. Um, once upon a time, we would do it with tape, <laughs> with that magnetic tape. Like if we wanted to like create a little delay, um, we could speed up or slow down the tape and you could place the audio on the tape with the playhead and then pick it back up a little bit later on the record head when that, as depending, and depending on how quickly that tape was moving, that difference of time between that, that record head and the playhead, uh, that would be different time. That's why, have you ever heard the term tape delay, like on a plug-in or something? That's what that is. Is it's because we literally used to do it with a tape machine. <laughs> so it's like a little oval yeah. tape and then there's like yeah. two little, yeah. that's really cool. Um, it's like, have you ever watched like the, the TV show, like Six Million Dollar Man? You know, like, shit, 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 shit. You know, every time you did something, you're like bionic, the bionic woman, or whatever, like, shit, 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 shit. all right? That's what they're doing. They've got a loop of tape going, and they made a little sound, and it was like echoing, because it would like record, play, record, play, record, play, record, play, record, play, a little bit quieter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, there's, so there's various ways to do it, um, but it all involves manipulating the signal in time in some way. Um, this button is not manipulating time, okay? It is just inverting the polarity. Why? That, okay, that's a great question. <laughs> Why in the world would you ever want to do that? Um, well, there's a few reasons. Um, I'll give you a few examples. Let's say, um, you um, are, have, are pointing microphones at a drum, for example, okay? Um, sometimes you might... Uh... Sorry, I was just, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about the Phantom of the Opera thing that you were talking about, how the guy reversed the polarity on the two speakers, right? Maybe? The, the AU you know, system? Yeah. That's something else. Okay. But yes, that involves polarity. Sorry, you know, yeah, that, that does involve polarity. Um, but let's say, um, let's say you're miking up a drum, okay? And you've got, um, oh, I don't know. Um, you could put a mic underneath that drum. And when you hit the drum, that would pulse the air, hit the mic, and the mic would go, right? But what if you also have a mic over top of that drum set, okay? and you hit the drum, and when the, the, the membrane of the drum goes down, it pushes on that mic. But what's gonna do the mic that's up above? It's gonna pull on it, all right? And if you happen to be mixing those two things together in the mixing console, you got two copies of the sound of that drum. One is doing a pulse like this, and the other is doing a pulse like this. So they're opposite each other. And when energy starts opposing other energy, it gets in a fight. And, and nobody wins, actually. Uh, it's called a cancellation. A lot of that energy, if not all of it, gets canceled out because you can't both push and pull at the same time. Um, and so you're gonna wonder, like, I've got mics on this thing, like, why is the signal not getting through very well? 
screensaver now? Um, there you go. So like, you know, why is the signal not getting through? And it's going to be because you are, um, let me turn this off. How do I turn this off? Battery maybe? Um, Think so. Screensaver. I don't know. I'll have to wiggle it every once in a while. Sorry. Um, all right. So um, now, how do you fix that? If you've got these two mics working in opposition to each other, well, you could turn one of them off, not have it be running through the mixer and then they're not gonna fight each other, but maybe that other mic is picking up something that you want. Um, well, um, you could uh, try to move them, right? Or you could just invert the polarity of one of those mics. <laughs> and now they're working in the same direction, right? They're both doing the same, same thing together, okay? and now they won't be canceling out when you mix them together on the mixer. So then why do the, no, JK, answer my own question. Okay. Yeah. Um, the charge is supposed to be, like a nice charge B minus is not really cool because mm -hmm. there's some other things where you're doing B, but some of this is the best way to merge it up to you, so I just want to understand that. We're not gonna spend a ton of time on that because um, it's hard to really, learn that without having the things here to play with. Um, so that's something we sort of talk about when we do the, the actual shows and we have those things there. So we'll spend a ton of time talking about that. Um, some other scenarios for polarity is what if, hypothetically speaking, uh, you are uh, doing sound at a school where people take classes in how to make cables and those cables get then used on actual things. Speaking from experience. Yeah. And, you know, what if <laughs> that student who tried to make that cable uh, got the white and the black wires mixed up? And well, they put the white it. wire on pin three and the black wire on pin two. And it's supposed to be the other way around. What's going to happen? It's going to reverse the polarity. It's going to reverse the polarity, right? That cable's still going to work. It's still going to pass audio, but that audio is going to be backwards. Like the polarity is going to be inverted. On. And you said there's no way to tell, like audio wise, if the. So how would you even That's know? Unless you're that random guy. <laughs> unless you're the random guy who thinks he can do it, obviously. So you but can't hear polarity. It's so stupid. I so wish I could. <laughs> uh, yes. The cable, that's why the cable checker is wired in that way where you have the button and the light. And if a different light comes on than the button you push, then that's how you know that you got a wire cross somehow, okay? Um, but that cable will still work. It'll just be out of polarity. And you might go years without knowing that or that, that ever being a problem for you until you're in a scenario where you're using that cable connected to a microphone and you're using a second cable connected to a different microphone, and both those microphones are pointed at the same thing. Okay. Mm. And then you mix those two sounds together, and now those two mics are opposing each other and creating cancellations. Mm -hmm. Is that like the feedback that you get? It's not feedback. What would happen is they would, um, they would oppose each other, and the, it would get quieter. Oh, right? like a dropout? It's like anti-feedback. Yeah. Things will get quieter. It, it can also sometimes uh, sound like comb filtering a little bit, um, although it's not it technically not because it's not a, it's not an offset in time. Can you but give it, me like a like a definition of cancellation? No sound. Thanks. <laughs> so helpful. <laughs> I did that. I did that. Is it because they're since they're working in oscillation, <laughs> they're not going as far up and down? Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can. I'm gonna try to like demonstrate this. So I've got two channels here that are the piano. 
Okay. So I'm going to invert the polarity on one of the channels. Do that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they're now they're they're right now they're in polarity between each other. I'm going to invert the polarity of one of them. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Set. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Is that wait, 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 tell me which one is which. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's like applying sound check. So there's some frequencies that are getting canceled out here. Okay. Yeah. And it's the frequencies that are the same in both channels. So the frequencies that are the same in both signals are getting canceled out. The ones that are unique aren't. And so you're doing this and you're going, where's all the low end on the piano? And, and and you're looking at, are both the mics working? Yeah, both the mics are working. Do I have one pointed at the low end? Yeah, I have one pointed at the low end. They're both working. Why, where's all the low end going? You probably have a polarity inversion on one of the mics. And then you're mixing them together. But listen to what happens. So it's inverted, right? Now watch what happens if I do this. Now the low end comes back. Yeah. Now oh. it goes away. That's actually more. That's <laughs> Interesting. So that's how you would test that theory. Like, if you think it might be a polarity inversion, just like duck one of them. You're like, oh, look, the low end comes back. Okay, great. It's, it's a polarity inversion. And then now, you, just press the little funky button. you could, you could leave the console, walk all the way down check to the stage, unplug the XLR, take it apart, <laughs> look at that one. That looks right. Go to the other one, take that one apart, look at that. No, oh, that one looks right. Hmm, that's weird. You walk all the way back and you take apart the other end and look at each one. Eventually you'll find the one that's backwards. Uh, and then you have to, go to, the shop and then you have to like, get your soldering iron out and swap the wires. <laughs> you can actually buy little polarity inversion barrels. We have a couple in our shop that are literally just wired backwards on purpose so that you can undo the back. It's like backwardsing the backwards. How you know? would I do that if you could just press the button? Exactly. <laughs> I just solved all sounds. <laughs> all of sound. So, yes, say? you could just say, you know what? It seems like I've got a polarity problem somewhere in my signal. Mm -hmm. And so I don't really have the time to figure out where, but somewhere on one of these signals, I've got a polarity inversion. I'm just going to invert the polarity and fix the problem for now, and then I'll sort it out later. Any question? So, so when you say low end, yeah. what, what do you mean by that? Okay, good. So um, we, uh, when we, we tend to describe sounds um, according to so the frequency that they occur. So sound um, occurs when you push and pull on air molecules. So you squeeze them together, you stretch them apart. And when that happens, it pushes and pulls on your eardrum. And that creates these little electrical impulses that tell your brain that you heard something. Now, when you do that really fast, it refers to a higher pitch. So, uh, for example, mm, that's one pitch. Mm, that's a lower pitch. It's a lower frequency. Mm, lower, mm, higher. Okay. Uh, so. Depending on how fast you, you do that motion, that pitch goes higher. Higher and higher and higher, the faster you go. Now, the, the, the range of frequencies that most people on average tend to hear is between the range of 20 hertz, which is moving 20 times a second, all the way up to 20,000 times a second. So that 20, and we call that hertz. So the 20,000 hertz is going to sound much higher in pitch than the 20 hertz, which is going to sound much lower. Okay, and now most sounds that we listen to, almost every sound that you've ever heard in your life, is actually made of lots of different pitches all at the same time. So it's called a complex sound. A complex sound has some high stuff and it has some low stuff and it has some stuff in between. And so, uh, so one of the ways that we try to think about the sound is we want to make sure like, okay, it's got lots of different frequencies in there. I want to make sure I'm hearing all of them in the correct balance. 
right? I want the high stuff and the low stuff to sound like they are, you know, at the right loudness compared to each other. That doesn't necessarily mean they're the same loudness. Sometimes it might mean that, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean that, but you want them to be correct, however you want them to be. If you want the low sounds to be higher, you would correct that, make the, the low sounds more louder so that they were closer or farther away from the high sounds. So when we say high stuff versus low stuff, that's what we're talking about. And when we look at this thing, if you listen, you've got the really high sounds and you've got the really low sounds. So listen for the low sounds to go away. Okay. Now they came back. You got it? <laughs> Make sense? Okay, good. Um, all right, we're about to. We're, gonna, we're getting there in just a minute. All right, any other questions about polarity? Yes? Well, it's not about polarity. I was just going to say loudness is gain, right? I mean, mm, sort of. Sometimes. I think that's the next knob. Yeah. The line. That is the next knob, yeah. but I'm going to talk about that in a second. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure we, we understand polarity. Yeah, this is not a button you just push randomly. Um, and there are a lot of things that people will tell you this button does that it doesn't do. Uh, well, there you, I bet you you could find somebody on YouTube that will tell you <laughs> that if you push this button, it will help you with your feedback problems. Oh. Just well, I, I it will guess. not. It will not help you with your feedback problems. If your feedback is messed up Well, the idea there is when feedback is happening, you have like this sound that's like regenerating through your system. Like it's coming out of the microphone, coming back, coming out of the loudspeaker, coming back into the microphone, and then doing that trip. And eventually there will be a certain frequency that will lock into a certain phase relationship and start reinforcing itself and building and building and building. And like it gets carried away and you get this one big squeal that comes out of the sound system. Okay. Well, um, some might say you could invert the polarity of the mic and that would suddenly take that frequency and it would now be in opposition. The mic would be in opposition to what's coming out of the loudspeaker and therefore it wouldn't reinforce. So that one little squeal will probably go away or get quieter, but you know what's gonna happen? No. An octave above or below that is going to Suddenly start feeding that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there's going to be this, or not, maybe not even an octave, but there's going to be some other frequency that will, get stuck. that will now get stuck, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't solve your feedback problem. So it's just changing your feedback problem to another point. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, so there are people that will tell you that this button will help you with your comb filtering problems. And that's just not true. Not true so at all. It doesn't comb so comb filtering is what happens when you take two complex sounds that have multiple frequencies <laughs> in them and you sum them together, you mix them together slightly out of time. So one of them is delayed a little bit and it came a little bit later and then you sum them together and they're offset in time. And so the relative phase relationships of each frequency are all out of whack. And some of those, two, some of those frequencies will come together and they will reinforce and get louder. Some of them will cancel out and go away and then everything in between. And so you end up, if you actually graph the result of that, you have these like boosts and then these dips and then these boosts and these dips all the way along that spectrum of frequencies. Uh, and if you graph it, it looks kind of like a hair comb, which is why we call it comb filtering. Uh -huh. um, happens all the time. You're gonna spend the rest of your life combating comb filtering. Okay. It's comb, not comb. cone? Comb, comb, C-O-M-B. C-O-M-B, comb filtering. Um, <laughs> And uh, you are going to, it, it, comb filtering happens all the time. You can't avoid it. It, it will always be there. It, um, my voice is comb filtering right now um, because it's going straight from my mouth to your ears and it's bouncing off this floor and going to your ears and the floor bounce is getting to you a little bit later. That's the Phantom of the Opera thing, right? Where you, <laughs> right? Yes, you're there, you're there. You, you we made made it, we got there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's hitting it in the air in your ears, know it in the air, but in there, it does not sound good and then it does some stuff. So true. Um, Jason talked at us for like yes, five minutes. Yes, I was going to say, this. it was the guy who... Yeah, like, it's the ABC. Yeah, you're on the right track. Yeah. So the AB system is a way of combating comb filtering. Okay. Um, 
But uh, so anyway, comb filter com happens for a, a, a ton of different reasons in a lot of different ways, and it will ruin everything you're trying to do. It makes everything sound terrible. Um, and you spend a lot of time trying to fix that. Um, but this polarity button will not fix that problem. <laughs> all it will do is shift it. It will just turn all of the cancellations in that comb filter into a reinforcements, and all the reinforcements into cancellations. And you've got comb filtering again, just a different kind of sound. Okay, so those are some of the examples of things that you will hear people say, oh, push that button and it'll sort out your comb filter. Push that button, it'll help you with your feedback. No, it won't. Um, it, you, there's really, you know, the only reason you need to push that button is if you have polarity inversion. Okay. Sorry. The only way to know if you have a polarity inversion is if it sounds whack, kind of like if you do the... Yeah, so you can only hear, you cannot hear polarity. Right. In so and of itself, okay. right? So um, the only time you actually hear polarity or polarity inversion is when you hear the same sound twice. Mm -hmm. And one of them is in polarity, one is out of polarity, and they are hitting, they're colliding in the air or colliding in your ear or something. That's when you notice it. But if you only have one sound all by itself that is inverted, you'll never know it's inverted. And it's not a problem. And it's not a problem either. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, having it inverted is not necessarily a problem. It's only a problem if you try to combine that inverted sound with a copy of mm -hmm. the same sound that isn't inverted. Mm -hmm. gotcha. um, and that's the thing that mixers do, <laughs> is mix multiple sounds together. Mm -hmm. And if two of the sounds happen to be similar enough, and one of them, but one of them's out of polarity, then they'll do that weird thing where they start canceling things out. And things get quieter. You don't know why. Um, anyway, that's what happens. All right, we good? We good with polarity? All right. So the next thing you encounter is this big red knob. And this red knob, is this one is called gain. Sometimes this might be called a uh, preamp. Um, in some analog consoles, you might see the word trim. Trim technically means something different, um, but sometimes that word will be used to describe what this gain knob does. Um, well, what does this actually do? Well, this gain knob controls a circuit called a preamplifier. Well, what is an amplifier? An amplifier is a electro electrical circuit that amplifies or increases the strength of the electrical signal. It makes it bigger. So you can go from a little tiny little voltage to a bigger voltage. Amplifies it. Okay. Uh, this yes. Yeah, it's an electrical circuit that amplifies or makes bigger uh, the electricity. So it increases the voltage. To know what? Okay. Depends. Whatever you want. Whatever you turn it on Yeah. So depends on how much you want. Now, some amplifiers have a fixed amount that they amplify. Some amplifiers have a variable amount. You can decide how much you want it to amplify. Um, so uh, what the signal that comes off of these little microphones is really, really tiny, like it's in millivolts. Um, and we tend to, um, you know, when we get into a mixer like this, an analog line level mixer, you tend to want the signal to be hovering around one or two volts. So the nominal operating level is, is actually 1.23 volts. Uh, when, so when the meter hits like zero, um, that should be 1.23 volts. Okay, um, and so the signal is coming off the microphone is really tiny, little millivolts. You want it to be up at like one or two volts. You're gonna have to amplify that voltage. And that's what the preamplifier does, it amplifies. So the preamplifier has a superpower. Uh, and it's the most expensive part of this entire signal chain is the preamplifier because of the superpower that it has. And to understand what the superpower is, you need to understand something about electrical circuits that do audio. Every electrical circuit that can process an audio signal will introduce noise into that signal. What is noise? Noise is... Let's see if I can 
get you some noise. Oh, hang on. That's noise. Okay. Every electrical circuit creates that. And if it happens to be an electrical circuit that you are using to make audio or pass audio, uh, that you will get some of this noise added to your sound every time. You can't not have that happen. You will always get a little bit of noise. Um, and there's been a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of people have done a lot of research and, and, and some really incredible innovation to try to minimize that as much as possible. Because that's terrible. Nobody wants to listen to that. I do. Right? Um, that, that's not a very good show. Oh. Right? It's like the ocean. Right? Yeah, As opposed to that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not saying you couldn't use noise artistically. You absolutely yeah. could, but generally speaking, we try to avoid that. Okay, um, and that's the problem. Is like every everything that you pass the audio through is going to add some of that to the signal. Um, and your mission is to minimize that as much as possible. And you want you can't get rid of the noise. The noise is always there. But you want your sound to be a lot louder than the noise. Okay? Right now, this is my sound and the noise are about the same level. Okay? And that's not good. <laughs> okay? What I want is for my sound to be a lot louder than the noise. I still have the noise there. So your goal is to, if this is to make that difference between the noise and the sound that you're trying to work with, you want that to be as big of a difference as you possibly can. It's called the signal to noise ratio, or SNR, you'll see that sometimes. Signal to noise ratio. And you want the signal to noise ratio to be a really big number, representing the difference between the signal, which is your sound, and the noise, which is the stuff that's always there. Okay, so now back to the preamplifier. The preamplifier has a superpower, uh, and it is the most expensive electrical circuit that is in the, in the mixer. Why? Because it has the ability to amplify the signal without amplifying its own self. Yes. This is kind of a silly question. Okay. Is it like preamplifier because it's making auto before you make a lot of noise? Well, when we talk about an amplifier, we tend to think about like the um, like the big amplifiers we use for the loudspeakers, right? So we take you know we have power amplifiers, which are these big rack mount things that require a lot of electricity. And we pass our line level signal into it, and it turns that like one or two volt signal into many many volts signals that you can then use to drive a loudspeaker. So the preamplifier is just the first amplifier. It's the amplifier you use to amplify it before you amplify it, right? Um, turns out, we'll get to this in a minute, the fader doesn't actually amplify. It's an attenuator. It makes things quieter, okay? But the preamplifier's job is to make stuff louder or higher and Good preamplifiers can amplify the signal without amplifying its own noise. The preamplifier absolutely introduces noise. And hopefully it's not very much. And you pay for that. Okay, you pay for preamplifiers that have low self noise and don't amplify that self noise. Yes. So does it amplify other noises then? Yeah. So if there's noise in the signal already, it will amplify that noise just like it amplifies everything else. But its own noise 
doesn't get amplified, at least not as much as it's amplifying mm -hmm. the signal, right? That's its superpower. Yes? Uh, how does it distinguish what is its noise? It doesn't. Or like, how, how does it not amplify its own noise? I don't know. Magic. Okay, so wow. it's, it is just a superpower. So yeah. superpower is okay. Jason's speak for I don't know how this works. It's I don't know how this magic. works. Okay. okay. Um, it's, it's, nothing was magic, dude. it's not magic. Except for the smoke. It's electricity. It's it's not magic, but it's just like there's people that are like really, really smart people that have designed these circuits. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you'll hear, um, you might have heard people, maybe even people on YouTube, <laughs> say things like, the preamps on this thing are really warm. Warm? Yeah. Or something like that. Ooh. Or the preamps on this are really quiet. I prefer that. Um, when they say warm, what they usually mean is you can turn the preamplifier really high mm -hmm. and you don't hear a lot of noise. Everything still sounds good. So, so bad preamplifiers, cheap preamplifiers, you know, they're useful within a certain range. Then you go much farther than that and they start sound, you know, the noise creeps in and it starts to kind of sound really, really bad. But good preamplifiers stay quiet the full range that you could amplify. Okay? Is there any way to tell um, whether it's a cheap preamp or if it's noise in the signal? Sure. Um, that's something that we'll learn more about in the system engineering class next year. Okay. That's, that's a process called gain structure. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to make sure that you've like, you're amplifying in the right places mm -hmm. and not in the wrong places. Okay. Okay, so that's, there's a whole methodology for figuring that out. Cool. Um, and that's how, by the way, I just made noise is by de-optimizing my gain structure. <laughs> Okay, so I did the opposite of what you're supposed to do, and I made noise. Mm. Um, so. So my high school is kind of like. Yeah. <laughs> but interesting thing is, I've got the fader up now, and I don't have the noise. Why? Because the preamp's all the way down. So I was actually amplifying the self noise of the preamp. Mm. <laughs> so the preamp isn't that good because if you just turn it up all the way. You can no, it's pretty good. Um, these are these are not bad. Okay. Um, but there's nothing plugged into this. Oh. And so all you're really getting is the noise. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So um, so that's the superpower of the preamp. It amplifies the signal without amplifying its own noise. And so what is the job of the preamp then? Uh, well, the job of the preamp is to amplify the incoming signal as much as you possibly can without distorting it. Because if you amplify it too far, then you'll hit the limits of the electrical circuit. So the electrical circuit can only handle a hot certain voltage, right? Anything higher than that voltage, and it just can't handle it. It's just going to clip it, okay? And clipped audio sounds really bad. You wouldn't want to hear what that sounds like? Yes. Okay. Here's my kick drum. Oh. I'm clipping it. Yeah, distortion. So there's a game on Sound Gym called Distorted Reality, yeah. um, and it trains you to recognize clip distortion. Yeah. Okay? Because uh, it's bad. We don't want that. And sometimes you don't always know that it's happening, and so you need to train your ears to be able to hear it when it happens. Okay? Uh, now, the mixing console will try to help you a little bit, and there's usually going to be some kind of light mm -hmm. called a clip or a peak light it will attempt to tell you that the signal is clipping. But, <laughs> but there's a little bit of a problem with that. So there are people out there that on YouTube? <laughs> some of them are probably on YouTube um, that uh, will judge the quality of a piece of sound equipment, a mixer in particular, by how good it sounds when the clip lights turn on. Mm. And they will use that, to, they will say, oh, this thing's got tons of headroom. Yes. You can drive it really hard and it still sounds good. Uh, right? It's got, you know, it's got so much potential. Like I was like pushing everything. All the peak lights were on and it still sounded clean, but. right? It, the distortion is so minimal on this thing, right? 
and they will judge the quality of the equipment based on that, based on how good it sounds when you're pushing it to its limits. Okay, so you know this now, because I just told you. And now imagine you're a person who designs and sells mixing consoles, and you know that people are going to judge how good it is based on how it sounds, how good it sounds, when the clip light turns on. What are you going to do? Oh. I would make the wiggle room bigger. I would, yeah. I mean, you're going to make the light turn on before it actually clips. That's... <laughs> Big sound, you've done it again. <laughs> so, sometimes that light is lying to you. Um, and the light might be coming on, but the signal hasn't actually clipped yet. Um, so think of it more like a warning light. You're getting close, but you may or may not actually clip yet. Is this more like prominent in the newer ones? Or no, this, is, this has been going on for years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so just, you know, heads up. Uh, that light sometimes lies to you. Generally speaking, it usually comes on 6 dB before a clip actually occurs. So that's, that's generally when most people decide to turn it on, is 6 dB before the clip point. How um, do you know that? Uh, 6 dB specifically? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to choose to believe you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some, some, some manufacturers are like transparent about this, and they will yeah. put that in the manual. Um, and they will actually say the clip light turns on nice. 6 dB below the clip. Um, some don't. Um, but that's not so that's how I know, is, some, is the ones that are talking. Um, okay, so your job is, remember, you want to get your signal as far away from the noise as possible, and you get that by amplifying the signal, so with its louder or higher voltage compared to the noise. So you want to turn this up. Mm -hmm. You want to turn it up. But if you turn it up too far, okay. it'll clip and distort. Okay. So you're trying to figure out, how far can I turn this up? without distorting it. And that's your mission, is you want to turn it up as hot as you can get it without clipping it. Okay. And hot is loud? Loud, yeah. Okay, warm. Just making sure, just yeah. double checking. Okay, so um, now what you might notice is I have on the kick drum here, I've got that preamp turned all the way down and the peak light is still turning on. So what's up with that? Computer. What? The computer is sitting nope. enough? Nope. The, the computer is not clipping. Mm. Okay. Is there something else that's turned up that shouldn't be? Nope. Is oh uh is the master turned on? Uh, is it no, I'll turn that down. Oh. Uh. Is it, is it the 6 dB below where it's actually clipping? Is that why it's turning up? Well, no, it probably is actually turn clipping. Turn it up oh. by 6. Oh, no. What did you do? I mean, I'll let you, I'll let you, we'll see. Let's see. Let's see. I feel like a fool. <laughs> yeah, it's distorting a little bit. How? So how? Ooh. Why? Um, Anybody know? You push the bus and you should have. <laughs> don't have think about this Should we know the answer? I don't know. Some, somebody might. I'm okay. not expecting that you would know. Okay. But, but. Is the master gain too high? There's no master. There's no such thing as master gain. Well, like, yeah, the, the big gain. <laughs> no. No, my old one had a big Does gain. clip when it's always off? No. Um, Are you lying to us and that's not actually a clip? Yeah. Like that's no, it is actually high. clipping. Okay. Um, Here's what's happening. The signal that is on this cable is exceeding the minimum voltage of the preamplifier. So the preamplifier can only go so low. Okay? Um, and this, the voltage of this signal is higher than that. So I've got to turn it all the way on. So th this is just the voltage on this is too much. So so it is something you're sending too much 
signal out of that thing. You're not sending it. Well, it's not clipping it here in the computer. The computer is not sending a clipped signal. The computer is sending a clean signal. But the signal that the computer is generating is actually going through that Rio box, and the Rio box is generating the actual voltage. But the voltage that that Rio box is generating is higher voltage than this preamplifier is designed to handle. Because there's a range. One of the ways that they make the preamplifiers do that cool thing is they narrow the range that it can operate in. It's just like, well, it can only like amplify quietly within a certain range. Okay? They can't make it work, you know, really wide. So they narrow it. So I'm just, um, the voltage is too much. This is the difference between microphone level and line level. So there are, there are four kinds of audio, anal, uh, anal, audio analog signals that you will encounter. And they, the difference is basically their voltage. So you have microphone level. Hold on. <laughs> can I ask you a question? Yeah. Actually, no. I'll let you go and then okay. see if my question is answered. So you have microphone level. And microphones tend to operate in a certain range of voltages. And, and I, I mentioned what those ranges are measured in a minute ago. Do you remember what that was? Millivolts. Millivolts. Literally tiny, tiny, tiny volts. Okay. There is line level. Line level is, tends to be around 1 or 2 volts in that range. There is instrument level, which is kind of what comes out of like electric guitars and stuff like that, um, which is more than microphone level, but less than line level. And then there is speaker level, or less speaker level. And that is lots of many, many volts, OK? Um, the approximate difference between microphone level and line level is about 20 dB, OK? Um, so. A line level signal is going to be 20 decibels higher than a microphone level signal, ish. Okay, um, and so to get this preamp, this preamp only operates is only able to operate cleanly within a certain range. And the wider you make that range, the harder it is to make it work, and it gets more and more expensive. Okay, to to get that circuit to do that, um, and you know. They probably sell this console for around maybe, this is probably less than $1,000, this console. Um, and they're trying to hit a certain price point with this thing. And so they're only going to, you know, they can't afford to put a preamp with massive range into it. Um, and very few places can. I mean, there's a really minimal range. And so uh, what most mixing consoles will have is some, what's called a pad. And what the pad does is it's a little circuit that just, it doesn't amplify, it actually attenuates. It reduces voltage by 20 dB. So it reduces the voltage by 20 dB, uh, taking that line level signal down into a range where the preamplifier can work with it. Can you maybe go back a little bit? Yeah. Where did I lose you? Um, when you were talking about before line level. Uh huh. Um, the well, I got the difference between the mic level and the line level, mm -hmm. but I got a little confused right before you were talking about the change mm -hmm. that the line level gets. Yeah. Okay. So I used this term dB. Um, dB stands for decibels, okay? And decibels uh, is a made-up number that sound people invented so they wouldn't have to do math on numbers that have more than three digits in them. Amazing. Cool. Um, <laughs> uh, when you say it like that, it's like... Oh. That is, it makes it sound unprofessional. Yeah. <laughs> sound, sound people are a very special kind of lazy. Okay? Um, so true. We, we will work very hard 
um, at some things. To not have to do other things. Yeah. yeah. The amount of effort we will expend <laughs> to avoid having to do something else that's hard. <laughs> it's very disproportionate. Is, it's very disproportionate. I once spent two months writing a computer program to save me a single walk up a flight of stairs. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is one. Yeah, so hard. Okay, okay, tell the story. So, no, really. Like, I once built, I wrote an app that would remote control a reverb machine that was on the second floor of the building so that I wouldn't have to walk upstairs and push a button once. No, but that's smart. Yeah. So why would you have to do that? Yeah. yeah, but the number of buttons I had to push to write the program. <laughs> but now you don't have to expend that much. Now it's I never have to climb that staircase again, right? So sound people are a very special kind of lazy. And we really don't like to do math on big numbers. We would prefer to do math on small numbers. Because we don't like to break out the calculator. Okay, we would rather just do it all in our head. Okay? And so we, the difference between the quietest sound that our ears can hear and the loudest sound our ears can tolerate before they start bleeding is the difference of about a trillion. Oh. It's a really big difference. Those are, that's a big number. A trillion is, how many digits is in a trillion? Like seven, maybe. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least 10? At least 10 digits? That's a million. Maybe. There's at least 10 digits to do a, a, a yeah. trillion, right? That's a lot of digits. Those are big numbers. We don't like to do math on big numbers like that. Yeah. And so we invented a process to collapse yeah. that range of a trillion down uh, between zero and a trillion down to a, a range of about zero to 140. It's like Celsius. Yes. So if you said it was made up, is it like, is it truly really just, it sounds really, it's, or is there like you know, it is absolutely formless. It's based on logarithms. So, <laughs> so we literally, here's the thing. We don't like doing the math on big numbers. So instead, we said, I know, I'll do logarithms. Uh, <laughs> it is. I just, I'm getting more flashbacks to high school. And now. logarithms turn big numbers into small numbers. That's what they do, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's based on logarithms. Uh, so, um, we'll learn more about this in the sound system design class next year. We'll get, we'll go really deep into decibels. Okay. Um, but generally speaking, I'll give you the rule of thumb. Okay. When you're talking about voltage like this, that's running in a mixing console, you double the voltage. It's a six dB increase. You divide the voltage in half, it goes down six dB. You multiply the voltage by 10 and you get a 20 dB increase. Or you divide the voltage by 10 and you get a 20 dB decrease. Okay? That's kind of the rule. So, say you've turned everything up, there's no distortion, but it's still really quiet. Could you up the voltage to get it to be louder? Yes, and that's okay. the whole point. Okay. So, what's happening here is the line level signal is 10 times the voltage of the microphone level signal. It's a lot higher voltage, okay? So it's louder. It's louder, okay? And therefore, it's going into the preamplifier at too high of a voltage, 10 times the voltage. Okay. And the preamplifier's like, I can't handle that. I'm clipping. I'm clipping, way. right? And so what we do is we build in a little circuit in here that divides that voltage by 10. Yeah. So, <laughs> your question. So, say you're me and you're running out of mic lines and you really you have a lot of lines left. Can you? Is there a, like a barrel of this outside of? Oh, like a twenty dB bed? Yeah. Please, please. Is it expensive? No. Oh, great. So this is just like the reverse of phantom power. Loop no, no. Phantom power is ele is an electric is a, a power source that powers the device. Okay. What a pad is, is it's just, it's a, it's a reduction. It just reduces the voltage of the signal. So it's already okay. coming into the Yep, console. divides it by 10, mm -hmm. okay? And you divide it by 10 and you get a 20 dB drop. 
okay? So a pad will sometimes, there'll be a button that says minus 20 dB. Uh, or it might oh. just say pad. There's the button there. Like, this console does not have a button that oh, does this, okay. okay? Some consoles will. This console has the pad built in to the quarter inch connector. So there's the XLR connector, which is this. And then there's the quarter inch connector like this. And the, the XLR connector is labeled mic, M-I-C. And the quarter inch connector is labeled line. And built into that quarter inch connector is a 20 dB pad, which means uh, if you're going into the XLR and you're clipping when the gain's all the way down, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I, I've, I've exceeded the voltage. And it's because I'm running at a line level signal. Okay, and it's a hot line level signal. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take that XLR and adapt it to a quarter inch, and I'm gonna plug it into the line level input. And, and it just ducked that voltage by 10 dB, or 20 dB, and now it's like a microphone, and now it's in the range of the preamplifier that the preamplifier can work with. Cool. Okay. Now, some mixing consoles will have a button that let you do that, and you can still use the XLR input, and you just push a button, and it pads it down 20 dB, and you're good to go, okay? Uh, once you've done that, and now I've done that, now what I gotta do is I have to figure out how hot can I push this preamp without clipping. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, so what you just attached to the XLR was like, it was, it was the pad? No, what I attached to the XLR was an adapter. It's just a cable. And on one end of the cable is an XLR connector, on the other end of the cable is a quarter inch. We made this cable, so okay? There's, no, there's nothing in there other than wire. So what's the difference between an XLR and a quarter inch in, in terms of voltage? Nothing. The connector is just a connector. The cable is just a cable. The cable doesn't care how many volts are on it. Okay. Okay? Wow. Well, it kind of cares, a little bit, but, oh, but that's not. That's a fire code thing. That's another <laughs> issue. That's not, you know, but, uh, yeah. The difference is there's a, the, the connector that's on the mixer that this plugs into has that pad built into it. But so if I want to get the pads, I have to go through that quarter inch connector because the, my, the XLR doesn't have it. Why, why not? Because that would cost money to add another button. Yeah, you have oh, big sound. Oh. You have to have that though? Like, is that just like your loss? Yes. Well, no, I could have just had a quarter inch, an XLR to quarter inch snake, which we have yes. in the shop, okay. but then I couldn't do this cool little <laughs> lesson. Um, but, but why wouldn't they just put pads on all of them? How many meters there are? Well, you know, each switch is going to cost you 50 cents. Um, and You're telling me that that so, nine hundred dollar console. But then you gotta like punch a different hole in the in the thing, and that's more screen printing. So, there's a little bit more wire involved. It just adds up. So I adding a pad directly into the line <laughs> is cheaper than adding a button. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's stupid, and I hate it. <laughs> Let it be known. <laughs> so okay. So now I gotta turn this up. I gotta turn this gain up as hot as I can get it without clipping. Um, I can start without even listening to it. Like everything can be down and I can just turn this up and I can watch for when that light comes on. Oh, the light's coming on. All right, I'm gonna back it off a little bit. Back it off. Back it off. A bit more. Okay. Oop. So we're doing sound check right now. And I'm telling the drummer, just hit the kick drum. Hit it as loud as you're ever gonna hit it. Louder, louder. How hard are you gonna hit it? You know? And See what that is, and you turn down your gain until that doesn't clip. You can do the same thing with singers. You say, hey, just what's the biggest thing you're ever gonna do? Just belt for me, real like, quick. Just what's the what's the loudest thing you plan to do in the show? And so you, you they do that, you turn up the gain, and then you turn it down 10 dB from that. Because uh, they're always gonna do it louder than they think they will. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, what if they are like a really quiet character and they're like shy or whatever <laughs> but they have one moment where they scream really loud yeah. would you base it on the scream or would you base it on what they are it depends do you need to amplify that scream oh true you could just if they're yeah. screaming that in depending on the You're room right. yeah like okay okay belt 
it's a low well, no, I'm saying, I'm just saying, if you, whatever the loud thing is, is that something you plan to amplify through the sound system? If it is, then that needs to be clean. Okay. And in that case, you would want to calibrate according to that. Okay. But if, if, that, if whatever that thing is they're going to do is not going to be at a time when you're sending the signal through the system, then who cares? Let it okay. clip. Okay. Right? Okay. So I've got it down now, but here's the interesting thing. So I'm going to take this up now. Let me just, let's just listen to it. And knowing what I know, that the clip light lies to us. Let's just see, can we turn it up any higher? And let's, can we use our, our sound gym ears to hear the clip? showing you the difference like just because the lights on doesn't mean it's distorting it means it's getting close <laughs> what's that We're not high enough. We gotta keep going. yeah so but for purposes of of today we'll assume that the clip light is not lying to us okay and i'm just gonna adjust that Should okay the button just says like what do you say minus 20 it'll say the button if it has a button it'll say minus 20 db or it'll say pad what do you or it'll say mic slash line. Does the M7CL have this button? No. Dude, okay. Obsessed because, with how you know that. That's because crazy. I knew you would. the M7CL <laughs> has an auto sensing preamp. So there's a little relay built into that input. And when the voltage exceeds the range of the preamp, that relay fires and it automatically pushes the pad button for you. So we could have just been using lines the whole time? Yeah. And oh you'll actually God. hear it. <laughs> if you turn the gain, you will hear a click. That's <laughs> crazy. You'll hear a thing go click. And that's the relay firing. Uh, that. Turning that off the pad. So cool. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> M7CL. It's we're from Yamaha. Yeah. Or whatever. Is that a medium one? Eh, probably. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So I've got this one pretty good. Um, and let's try this one now. Same thing. I'm just going to turn it up. Turn it up. Keep going. Oh, where it clicked. Okay. Oh, clipped a little bit there on the toms. All right. This doesn't have anything to do with how loud it is coming out of the loudspeakers. Okay. It's not about that. Um, I just don't want it to clip, and I want it to be as hot as I can get it without clipping. Because if I can get it as hot as I can, then my noise will be slow. Right? And that's what I want. So I'm just going to do this. I don't even have to listen to it. I can just do it for each one. I'll do it for number three now. Um, anybody want to try? Yeah, I'll yeah. do it. All right, come on up, Ace. You can do um, you can do this piano. So it's number four. Okay, and it just.
you do. Okay, anybody else want to try? I got a few more. All right, Brooke, come on up. You can do the bass. Bass is number six. Number seven. See if we can hear what it sounds like when it really distorts. Crank the preamp. So it's double distorted now, right? I kind of like it. I kind of like it. Okay. Very good. Pretty close. All right. Um, anybody want to do the mic? Do it. Yeah, April, come on up. Oh, Ken? Yeah, come. I got, I got two mics. Whatever. <laughs> okay, so you're going to do nine. So nine is the mic. So you're going to have to talk into it while you do this. Or I can talk into it while you do it. Okay. Yeah, how about that? All right, here we go. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage. Princes to act and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire, you got, you got a long ways to go, crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this, keep going, don't be afraid, crank it. <laughs> on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Wow. All right, you got yeah. it? Yeah. All right, there you go. So, see, now I can push the fader and you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, April, come on up. You can do the shotgun mic. Do the, like, divorce papers one. So the shotgun mic is 10, so that'll be this one. So it's this game. So there you go. You can talk or I can talk, whatever you want to do. All right. Um, here, we'll point it down. Okay. Uh, we are amazed. For thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourselves thy lawful king. And if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God. There, clip, see? Mm -hmm. Show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know no hand of blood and bone can gripe the sacred handle of our scepter unless they do profane, steal, or usurp. Got it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Where's that from? Uh, Richard II. Shakespeare. Yeah. Every, every self-respecting sound engineer should have at least one Shakespeare monologue memorized. Does so that you have something to say when you need to test a mic. I guess. I a podcast time. This is when I 
All right. I mean, I like Shakespeare. It doesn't have to be Shakespeare, but... I read six chapters of Pride and Prejudice during As You Like It. It's amazing. I have an entire Christopher During one-act play memorized, you know, if, if Shakespeare's not your thing. But, okay. So, uh, all right. So we more or less did it, yeah? Um, we got a clip light coming on every once in a while, and we can correct that when we, when we want, but more or less there. Now, I want to point out that... Setting that preamp had nothing to do with how loud it was coming out of the system. Okay? And there are a lot of people who are now who are going to tell you that it has something to do with that. Because here's what'll happen. When you do this right, and I've got I'm gonna set my main output to just unity, uh, which no 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 reduction. And I'm gonna start to mix this thing. Oh, the fader up and it's already too loud. Right? And so there are going to be people that will tell you that the preamp is you turn that up or turn that down so that the fader can be at zero. And so that all the faders can be lined up in the same place. Okay, we haven't talked about the fader yet. I wish the camera could get that 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 <laughs> shake, that shake. Put your head under. Yeah. That, that yeah. shake. Yeah. yeah, it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, that's not what the preamp is for. Preamp has nothing to do with where this fader is supposed to be. Okay. We'll talk about the fader later. Um, now it is true that it's kind of hard to mix. With when you only have like a centimeter to work with. Like that is true, but there are way better ways of solving that problem than turning down your preamps and decreasing your signal to noise ratio. Um, what are the ways you said? Well, one way would be to just turn turn down the main output of the of the mixer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean yeah. Right? And then we can everything up. Then we can really work you now. Right? Um but if you've got this turned down and you're still really low, like I still am, like if I cut this really down here and if I really feel like for some reason that these faders need to be all the way up here and that's still too loud, I have too big of a sound system. I have spent somebody's money on too much sound equipment. So I need, I need, I need quieter sound equipment. Or I, can, or I can turn the amp down, this is what I'm going to do right now. There you go. So the amplifiers that are in those loudspeakers are, you know, they were doing more work than they needed to do. They're still doing, I mean, look at that. I can take that to Unity, it's still too much. faders up like I like them um, and I have really low noise because my preamps are up as hot as I can get them without clipping uh, and I'm running a hot signal through the console out the console into the amps and the amps are only amplifying a tiny little bit and so the opportunities for new noise to be introduced are really minimal right now okay this is good game structure uh, see, okay that's what I was gonna ask like, yeah. is that the game structure that's game structure what I just did is game structure. <laughs> so the class was basically about game structure? Yeah. <laughs> One of the things. All right. Um, what time are we supposed to finish? All right. So we, we're still good. We got time. We also have an all school meeting at 3 Just letting you know. Yeah. All right. 
I'm gonna talk about one more thing then, and then we'll and then we'll we'll wrap up. So there's one more button that I'll, I'll talk about today, and it's right here. And if you can see it, um, it's like got this little, you know, flat line followed by a diagonal line, and it has the it has 100 hertz written underneath that. This is what's called a high pass filter. Or some people will describe it as a low cut filter. Either term means the same thing. High pass, low cut, same thing. Okay. Um, what this is, this is an electric circuit that will attempt to remove frequencies that are lower than some determined point, okay? In this case, 100 hertz, because that's what it says. So what this thing is gonna do is it's gonna try to reduce all the frequencies that are lower than 100 hertz. In fact, it's gonna try to eliminate them or cut them. It's going to cut all the frequencies lower than 100 hertz. Or you could also describe that as it's going to allow all the frequencies higher than 100 hertz to pass through unaffected. Mm. Okay, that's why it's called high pass or low cut. Now, unfortunately, that's not like a brick wall. Like it's not like, you know, 99 hertz will not be audible anymore. There's a ramp to it. It's like a tail off, okay? So that 99 hertz will, will be a little tiny bit quieter, but 50 hertz will be a lot quieter, right? So there's a little ramp. Um, uh, this is pro I would guess this is probably a 24 dB per octave filter, meaning uh, 100 hertz is the cutoff point, which means 50 hertz will be 24 dB quieter. And then 24 dB per octave is probably what this filter is. It's called a fourth order filter. Um, First order filter would be 6 dB per octave. Second order filter would be 12 dB per octave. Third order would be 18. Fourth order would be 24 dB, okay? So uh, it's probably a fourth order filter, which means 50 hertz will be 24 dB quieter than 100 hertz. 25 hertz will be 48 dB quieter than 100 hertz. So there's a ramp to it. Um, well, why, do, why do you want this? Why would, why would this be a thing? Um, if you're like singing a little song and it's real high up there and you sometimes you your voice cracks when you hit the lower notes maybe I don't know <laughs> no really, it's not going to help with that yeah. um, I mean that's a good problem to want to try to solve but this button won't help you with that unfortunately when you're just cutting the low notes yeah but why would you want to do that because I, I can't make that noise <laughs> Well, then you don't have to cut them. Mm -hmm. Well, then they would, um, <laughs> if you're... Like, if the voice isn't making that sound, there's nothing to cut, right? Because if your amplifier, your mic is trying to amplify the stuff that's down there, wouldn't that be adding more noise that you would want to? Maybe. Brooke, what, what was your... Um, I was thinking it was like, but in the speaker cut. Like, mm, no, not really. Um, if you have, uh, like, one instrument, but it's connected to two, like one, if you're playing a piano and it's split down the middle, mm -hmm. maybe if you're playing the lower notes, but you want it to be picked up only on one side, you could do sure. high pass. Yeah, that's the reason, yeah. You got two mics pointed at one thing, mm -hmm. and you want one mic to emphasize the low stuff and one mic to emphasize the high stuff, yeah, you could use this to do that, sure. Um, the, the more common reason you would use this is high frequencies, higher frequencies are more directional than low frequencies. What I mean by that is that the low frequencies tend to go everywhere. Um, whereas the high frequencies tend to be more easily focused in one direction. So um, if you were to, well, I can demonstrate it actually. Um, so Listen, now 
I'm going to turn this away. Listen to the difference between the high frequencies and the low frequencies. Okay, so you probably heard the high frequencies got a little bit quieter, but the low frequencies didn't really change that much. Okay, um, why? Because low frequencies are kind of going everywhere. It doesn't really matter where you point the last speaker, they're just going everywhere. They're the, bigger waves, right? Yeah, they're a lot bigger. They're, the wavelengths are much bigger. So they're harder to control. Uh, so what, that, what tends to happen then is that low frequency energy is kind of going everywhere. And the high frequency energy is going the place that you want it. Um, so you, let's say you've got a mic pointed at, you've got many mics, and each mic is pointed at the thing that you want it to pick up. But you've got a lot of mics, and they're kind of in close proximity to each other. Well, each mic is going to pick up the high frequencies in pretty good isolation because high frequencies are going to only go the direction where you're pointing the mic. But the low frequencies are kind of going to go everywhere. And so that low frequency energy kind of gets picked up by several microphones usually. Um, and, therefore, and then you have several microphones going into the mixer, and then you mix them all together. And suddenly, like, everything starts sounding really bottom heavy. Like, you suddenly got a really excess of low end energy. Um, and your intelligibility goes down. Um, the mix is really hard to, to get clarity with because that low energy is just masking a lot of the detail and stuff because it's just kind of getting picked up by everything and then mixed together and amplified. Um, so a way to combat that is to filter, and this is kind of what Sam was, was getting to. You were getting close in principle to this. Um, you want to... Even, it do, even, if, even though the mic itself, the signal that that is going, doesn't have low frequency energy, uh, you can turn on that filter so that it's not picking up the low frequency energy from some other signals that are nearby. Okay? So, for example, okay, here's the, here's the kick drum. This has some good low frequency. I, I don't want to filter that. I'm going to leave that untouched. Okay, but this, the snare drum and the toms, you know, I'm going to go ahead and pop the filter in because I don't need any low energy off of that thing. So any low energy that's coming in on that is coming from somewhere else, and I don't need that. So I'll, I'll put it in there. Now this, same thing. This is the symbols. I don't need low energy there, so I'll filter that. Um, this piano, there's no, it's not doing a whole lot of things under 100 hertz that I care about, so I'll get rid of that. I'll turn that off for the button. Now the bass. This probably does have some energy at, at a low 100 hertz, so I'm going to leave that the, the filter off. Okay. This no, there's nothing in here below 100 hertz that I care about, so I'm going to turn on the filter and filter it out. Same thing here. Turn that out. The mic, my voice. Yeah, I don't I don't need anything below 100 hertz. Like my voice isn't producing anything like that. So if there's anything there, it's not something I'm trying to amplify. So let's go ahead and get rid of it. Same thing with this mic, right? So uh, this. Don't underestimate how big of a difference this can make. Um, doing it on one signal, nothing. Doing it on 50 makes a noticeable difference. Like if you suddenly eliminate that buildup of low frequency energy across several input channels, you hear it. You hear the difference. Everything gets a lot cleaner. It's easier to mix. Um, you know, the detail is suddenly coming through a lot better because that low frequency energy isn't building up and masking anything. Okay? So that's what that's really for. Is it, is it just like prevent, it cuts out all that, we call it bleed. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the mic bleed from picking up all that low frequency energy. Yeah? When you're doing this, is this safe to pop the filter on before you're even really setting everything? Probably. I mean, if you know what's, what you're going to be putting through that, you might know, like, Okay, well, this is the snare drum. I don't really care about the low frequency energy. I'm going to preemptively pop that in, right? What? If it's a voice, you probably don't need that. Now, some mixing consoles will give you a knob that lets you control that cutoff frequency, right? This one is fixed at 100 hertz, but some of them will let you sweep that. You can go, like, set it to 80 hertz or take it all the way up to, like, 200 hertz or something. I tend to want to take it up as high as I can get it, right? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that cut off to the highest frequency I can get to and still let all the good stuff through um, because that's just less bleed I'm getting from the other mics. Yeah. 
Theoretically, if you were mixing a musical, would you not put that on every single voice and then tell them to sing their lowest note and then go from there? No, because you know there's very few human voices that are going to be doing that low of energy. I mean, I've measured my voice. Mm -hmm. um, now, granted, I don't have the deepest voice on this planet, but if you measure my voice, the, the lowest you're going to see is around 250 hertz. I just mean, okay. like, if you can adjust it. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly it is dependent on the signal. So people who, who have higher pitched voices, um, I could probably get away with sweeping that cutoff filter a little bit higher for them. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I absolutely will do that. Um, and for lower voices, I might not be able to get away with it. But what I tend to find is certainly for like musical theater, we, the things we're trying to amplify and really deliver to the audience are frequencies in the range of one kilohertz to four kilohertz. That's the range that we're having a hard time delivering. And that's what we focus most of our attention to and when we're amplifying and delivering to the audience. And so even if you're cutting out some of the content that their voice is naturally generating, that's probably not the material that's having a hard time getting to the audience. Because remember, the low frequency energy goes everywhere anyway. So that's probably getting to their ears naturally pretty easily. So you don't need to focus on amplifying it as much. So you can get away with turning up that low pass filter, that high pass filter, mm -hmm. um, much higher usually than you think you can, especially okay. for a voice. Um, so you, if, you, if you ever looked at you know any of my consoles on the shows I'm doing, you would, most people are shocked <laughs> when they see how high I've dialed up those high pass filters. I've, I've swept them real high um, for that reason. Okay. All right. Well, we've gotten through that first preamp stage. Um, and next week, we'll start working our way through here. Um, and we'll, get to, we'll, go, we'll do the EQs next, and then we'll get into buses. Okay, so we'll do that next week. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, we use the word <laughs> to describe something else, but um, it's the word bus, like yes, for for like the school bus. Um, but we use it to describe something else. Okay.